first casual, casualty of war is the truth. We've had uh, U.S. intelligence agencies and, of course, the Biden administration have mm -hmm. been waging disinformation warfare against the American people. Crazy dream of uh, NATO membership that really, uh, I mean, if you look into it, there's really never been any chance whatsoever of Ukraine being a member of NATO. You know, the U.S. wanted to, you know, wanted to be the biggest bully on the block. And to do that, we had to, you know, show that, uh, you know, we could invade Iraq uh, for no reason. You know, an unprovoked invasion of Iraq, as as President George W. Bush uh, actually admitted on video just a couple years ago, when attempting to condemn uh, Putin, he actually condemned himself. Russia is a nuclear superpower, and you know the primary objective of U.S. national security policy should be to avert war with Russia and China because a war with Russia and China could destroy the U.S. and wipe us off the face of the earth. So right. we need to peacefully coexist with uh, Russia and China. We need to avoid their nuclear red lines in Ukraine and Taiwan. Everyone, this is David Pine. He's the executive vice president of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security. David is one of the few American voices that have deep connections to our government and aren't afraid to speak the truth. David is very much anti-war and believes the primary mission of the U.S. foreign policy should be to avoid nuclear wars with both Russia and China by respecting their red lines and learning to coexist. David is a fantastic author who publishes an incredible geopolitical newsletter and speaks out on the truth about America's involvement in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but also other devastating wars, like the major conflict we're seeing in Gaza and that the United States is firmly supporting. In today's interview, David provides us all a deeper understanding into the Russia-Ukraine conflict and some insights you most definitely have never heard before. Let's begin. Well, everyone, we have a special guest in the studio today. This is David Pine. He's the executive vice president of the Task Force on National and Homeland Security. David, thank you so much for joining our podcast today. Thanks, Cyrus. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Well, David, I wanted to bring you in because over the last couple of months, you've been writing some very interesting articles um, on Substack and on online. And I think it's really important for the American public and really the world to understand what's really going on in Russia and Ukraine. We're trying to bring in different voices to understand that. I'm going to go ahead and bring up the article that you wrote. This is really interesting. It's the costs and consequences of Ukraine's disastrous pursuit of NATO membership. And this is measuring the cost of America's 16-year-long attempt to expand its liberal empire to Ukraine. And really, it's obviously a refusal to negotiate peace with no end in sight. So I'll give the stage to you and just kind of give me your thoughts as obviously we're entering now into the third year. There doesn't really seem to be an end to this conflict. Um, David, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, as has been often said, uh, the first casual, casualty of war is the truth. And uh, we've had uh, U.S. intelligence agencies and, of course, the Biden administration have mm -hmm. been waging disinformation warfare against the American people uh, mm -hmm. with their war propaganda. And the war propaganda is, uh, you know, Russia just out of the blue invaded Ukraine for, for no discernible reason reason, totally unprovoked. Uh, the facts couldn't be otherwise. I mean, certainly uh, we have to condemn Russia's uh, illegal invasion of Ukraine. That, that is in itself a war crime, right. uh, not not an egregious war crime as as uh, you know as other countries have have committed, but uh, you know something that that we we should oppose nonetheless. But. To say it's unprovoked is, you know, such an egregious uh, uh, statement against against the truth and the facts. Mm -hmm. I felt I, I had to publish, uh, you know, a series of articles such as this that uh, set the record straight. And, and by no means am I def a defender of Vladimir Putin. I think he's a brutal dictator who is, uh, you know, has killed some of his political opponents. That said, they Russia is a nuclear superpower, and the primary objective of U.S. national security policy should be to avert war with Russia and China because a war with Russia and China could destroy the U.S. and wipe us off the face of the earth. So right. we need to peacefully coexist with uh, Russia and China. We need to avoid their nuclear red lines in Ukraine and Taiwan. But uh, in terms of this article, this whole, just like Dr. John Mearsheimer predicted, uh, Russia would uh, would wreck Ukraine, led on a primrose path uh, in terms of, uh, you know, this this crazy dream of uh, NATO membership that really, uh, I mean, if you look into it, there's really never been any chance whatsoever of Ukraine being a member of NATO. So the, the whole Ukraine and NATO crisis was caused by U.S. leaders over a false pretense. Right. Uh, and even at the, the Vilnius summit, you know, my, my main picture for this article is 
a picture of Zelensky looking lost and confused and dejected because the Biden administration and other NATO leaders outright rejected uh, Ukraine's entry into NATO in terms of any timetable, any membership mm-hmm. action plan. And the reason is because, uh, you know, Germany, Turkey, uh, Hungary, and Slovakia would veto it. Ukraine just simply doesn't meet the qualifications for doing so. So the costs of, of the war thus far have been 30% of Ukraine's uh, population being uh, lost or, you know, refugees, uh, 30% of its GDP being lost, uh, 50% of its businesses at one point being closed, uh, 50% of its critical infrastructure being shut down, half a million uh, Ukrainian troops uh, killed or seriously wounded in battle. And, uh, you know, I've condemned the Biden administration policy as a policy of national suicide uh, in terms of fighting this senseless manufactured uh, war against proxy war against uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, and using hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian lives as cannon fodder. And, and you know, it, it's ironic, you know, that uh, principled opponents of, of the war, such as yourself and myself, are the ones that get attacked for uh, supposedly opposing Ukraine, when in fact, we're the ones championing Ukraine's best interests. Oh, absolutely, David. I think you've really a great opening statement. And I think you've really set the stage here because this is something that, you know, you know, is is so interesting as Americans, as we're watching the United States government continue this, and it's almost become something of, okay, you know, this, these are the bad guys. These are the good guys. You know, we need to always just support the good guys. I think what's, what's interesting is, is the only thing that we've actually done to Russia is just make their military stronger. You know, they've obviously shifted to a wartime economy. You know, the Russian military today in 2024, right now is, stronger than it was since the 1980s. I mean, they've gotten stronger. They're, they've shifted their economy. Uh, they were the only one that in you know that actually had a GDP that grew last year. Now, again, that is granted it is a you know war economy. They're shifting their industries to producing for this war. But I mean, their economy, their GDP outgrew all of the G7 nations last year and is predicted to do so again in 2024. So it's it's really an interesting one because you know what what is the what, what do you think is this this obsession with NATO uh, you know moving into Ukraine? Why is this just like it just seems like getting Ukraine into NATO is the crown jewel that everybody in the West wants? But what, what is the main reason behind that? What is the purpose behind that? Is it really just to provoke Russia, just to piss off Russia? Uh, I wouldn't say it was necessarily piss off Russia. It's it's an attempt to, yeah, it is an attempt to humiliate Russia, to uh, to show Russia who's boss. Essentially, uh, you know, General Colin Powell made a statement uh in congressional hearings that, you know, the U.S. wanted to, you know, wanted to be the biggest bully on the block. And to do that, we had to you know, show that uh, we could invade Iraq uh, for no reason, you know, an unprovoked invasion of Iraq as as President George W. Bush uh, actually admitted on video just a couple years ago when attempting to condemn uh, Putin, he actually condemned himself for for this for the illegal invasion of Iraq by one man that was unprovoked. I think it's just hubris. It's uh, you know, it's this U.S. um, national security strategy of of, uh, primacy, uh, liberal hegemony, Right. And we want to expand uh, America's liberal empire as, as far as possible, right up to Russia's and China's borders. You know, we have legitimate security interests in Taiwan, and and I don't, I'm I'm not trying to detract from that. But in terms of Ukraine, the U.S. there has only one uh, national security interest, and that is to avoid nuclear war with Russia, avoid right. World War III. And instead right. of doing that, you know, the Biden policy is actively provoking uh, Russia to to attack us. And and if Putin didn't have such such great uh, strategic forbearance, uh, which I think his patience is, is, uh, you know, is coming to an end uh, very soon, then, uh, you know, we could have already been destroyed by, uh, you know, Russian uh, nuclear cyber or super EMP retaliation. And, you know, Essentially, Biden is playing with the lives of uh, 275 million Americans that could die in such an attack. Yeah, it's it's very concerning, and I, I want to get your thoughts on uh, NATO specifically because you know I've had a chance to interview uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, very outspoken about this war as well, uh, very much echoing the same points that you've made as well, and just really wanting to have some more clarity, you know, from our leaders and really a better understanding of what's going on. I, you know, I stand right behind what you've said as far as you know our number one primary goal here is to avoid a nuclear war with Russia. Obviously, you know, uh, Russia is a nuclear superpower. It'd be a disaster for Russia, for um, America, but for world kind, you know, for humankind. So what what about NATO? I mean, I know Colonel McGregor has, has really come out and said that NATO just seems completely lost right now. They don't have the direction. You've got all these different nations with different opinions. We actually saw that with Fran- France's President Macron, who came out and said, you know, it's not against the, you know, we're not ruling out putting NATO troops on the ground in Western Ukraine. 
What do you think of when, you know, someone like Macron makes a statement like that? Well, I first want to say that, you know, I've, I've been saying since October of 2019 uh, with an article I published in World Net Daily, U.S. NATO membership is a noose around America's neck that could drag us down to nuclear war with Russia over uh, Ukraine or the Baltic states. And mm. and for that reason, I've, I've actively supported a, a U.S. withdrawal from NATO and converting it into an all, you know, a European led alliance. I mean, NATO in itself is not a problem, but it's it's U.S. involvement in NATO that has, has caused these conflicts. Because if, if uh, the U.S. wasn't part of NATO, then I think France and Britain, despite being nuclear powers, would behave much more circumspectly towards, uh, you know, Russia, which is far superior in terms of nuclear weapons. Yeah, NATO expansion and, and Macron's statement, I think it's uh, recklessly irresponsible of him to make a statement like that. You know, it's difficult for me to ascertain for sure if, if that's uh, merely strategic posturing, where he's He's uh, laying that out on the tables, kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Russia has often made nuclear threats, uh, some of which are serious, some of which are, again, strategic posturing to try to deter a further NATO escalation in terms of armament shipments and whatnot. Uh, but, uh, you know, Russia's made very clear that, uh, you know, uh, you know, a NATO expeditionary force crossing the border in Ukraine, particularly in central Ukraine, would, would be a nuclear red line for Russia. And I, and I, I think that's uh, very possibly true, although I think uh, I think Russia would, would kind of escalate up uh, the escalation spiral and, and resort to counter space and cyber attacks and perhaps super, a super EMP attack before it uh, used uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons against NATO forces. Yeah, I mean, this is um, this is really becoming a very uh, big issue here. And I want to want to go back to your article that you wrote, because this is very interesting, uh, talking about, uh, you have a section here that says, you know, the outbreak of the war in Ukraine was not difficult to foresee. Um, you know, Russia and Ukraine were actually collaborative strategic partners from 1991 to February 2014, um, by virtue of their joint CIS membership, which is a CIS free trade agreement, um, and a treaty of friendship um, before uh, Ukraine's pathway to this uh, NATO membership. Um, you have an interesting quote here from Vladimir Putin. This was given in Munich in 2007. Uh, we are seeing a greater and greater disdain for the basic principles of international law. This is extremely dangerous. We have reached that decisive moment when we must seriously think about the architecture of global security. So this is really, you know, Vladimir Putin sending out some early warning signs. I mean, as far back as 2007. Expand a little bit upon that just so more people have that context of, about what's been going on. Yeah, so a lot of people, uh, you know, don't really you know, they maybe weren't paying attention to, to Vladimir Putin uh, from the time he took power in uh, December of 1999 as acting president of Russia. Uh, but essentially, he he uh, he was viewed as a pro uh, Western leader. Uh, he was trying to uh, kind of engage Russia, you know, and uh, make it interconnected with the EU, um, perhaps even join some kind of common house arrangement, uh, you know, integrating Russia's economy uh, with the EU, as well as, uh, you know, joining NATO. Uh, I mean, during the Tucker uh, Carlson interview on uh, February 6th, uh, just last last month, uh, you know, Putin actually revealed that he uh, he asked um, Bill Clinton to to uh, if Russia could join NATO. And, and he got, you know, a negative answer on that. And we, we previously were aware that he uh, proposed joining NATO in 2002 as well. So uh, the turning point was 2007, because by that point, Bush had made clear that there hadn't been a formal declaration yet, uh, but uh, it made clear that Ukraine and Georgia would be invited to join NATO, uh, or at least there would be some kind of declaration that they would join NATO. And that was, that was uh, you know, Russia's number one red line, because uh, you know their their number one vital interest in terms of foreign policy is to in, was to ensure Ukraine's continued neutrality outside of NATO as a buffer state. And you know a lot of people don't realize that a buffer state doesn't mean a Russian satellite. A buffer right. state is uh, offers protection not only to Russia but also to NATO. It goes right. both ways. It, it's kind of like a demilitarized zone, and so it offers to provide security to NATO to NATO's member states. And with, uh, you know, with the fact that Ukraine can't join NATO, there was no reason not to accept uh, Putin's uh, offer to uh, guarantee to not invade Ukraine uh, in exchange for a written guarantee uh, that Ukraine would never become a, a member of NATO. But yeah, th this uh, Munich uh, speech was th the first time that, that Putin, you know, kind of came out uh, with some anti-Western rhetoric that kind of, uh, you know, took uh, NATO leaders off guard because, of course, uh, Putin had been very cooperative with NATO. He had 
essentially, con, you know, acceded to uh, the expansion of NATO uh, to include even former Soviet republics, uh, right. such as the, the Baltic states. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one that not many people know about is that, you know, the first thing that Vladimir Putin did was go, in fact, go to NATO and, and actually advocate for Russia to join NATO. And uh, of course, you know, NATO was founded to combat the rise of the Soviet Union. Well, of course, once that collapsed and Russia became independent, uh, all of these former Soviet republics became independent. You know, there there's an argument as, you know, is NATO really needed anymore? Obviously, that threat of the Soviet Union is now gone. And I think that's a very interesting thing. I mean, you pointed out, I mean, twice, you know, Putin has gone to NATO and said, include me. And I think there's, there's a big argument that can be made that the United States certainly could have done a lot more in incorporating into the global trade and the global system, you know, welcoming Russia in and actually, you know, giving them a foundation. But nonetheless, I mean, you know, what was interesting is obviously throughout the Cold War, Soviet Union is always seen as the enemy. And then as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, it still passes on, right? Russia's still the enemy. No, you're not going to join NATO. No, we still don't like you. No, you're still not going to be part of us. And, you know, no. And so I think you can only, you know, how many, you can only do so much, right? I mean, for, as far as uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin, if you're not going to keep getting rejected, well, then you're going to have to go on a different pathway. And it's it's unfortunate. I think the U.S. missed a, a good opportunity there. And I want to talk a little bit about now shifting into Ukraine, because you did touch on this is these staggering Ukrainian losses. Um, you know, there's obviously been a loss of territory, right? The actual size of Ukraine has been diminished because of, you know, rushing, taking back these these areas that are ethnically Russian speaking. Uh, the people there want to be part of Russia. Um, it's, a, it's a very complex situation for people, most people in America to really understand that the nuances involved in this. But I mean, we've seen um, a large percentage of their farmland, for example, destroyed. Um, I think you have in here that um, from the, the estimates of cost of reconstruction would be well over um, $1 trillion, which is just staggering and almost, you know, seemingly impossible to kind of rebuild Ukraine. So talk a little bit more about these losses for Ukraine and what is really going to be the future for this country? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, the costs are, are, are staggering. They're, they're beyond tragic. Uh, it's a human humanitarian catastrophe. I mean, uh, outside of Gaza, we just haven't seen a humanitarian uh catastrophe on this scale. Y Ukraine, you know, would have had all of its uh, territory uh, intact had it uh, had had the Biden authorized coup not occurred in February 2014. That was really was the trigger for the beginning of the Russo-Ukrainian uh, military conflict. And, you know, of course, Victoria Newland, you know, handpicking, uh, you know, uh, a new Ukrainian prime minister that was essentially a U.S. puppet. But, the you know, that and then, of course, the CIA bases and all the various provocations uh, just in 2021, there were, you know, three different uh, NATO exercises. Uh, but yeah, as I mentioned, the, the costs have been have been extreme. I, Ukraine was the uh, was the second largest country in Europe. It's now the fourth largest. It, you know, I think it had the fifth largest population. Now it's the sixth. Uh, I mean, it went down from, uh, let's see, about 41 million before the war, not including Crimea, to uh, about 28 million today. Right. So, uh, I mean, if, if we can imagine a future for the U.S. in which the U.S. lost uh, over 100 million people of its population, whether, you know, killed or, or that left the country, I mean, that's really kind of the comparison. And wow. uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the, the reconstruction costs are staggering and the losses just continue to pile up. I mean, uh, we had a, a Ukrainian general, I think, say that uh, uh, Ukraine was losing up to a thousand um, casualties, I think. Uh, I mean, just you know, really uh, crazy numbers of uh, numbers of troops, and there's no strategy. I mean, the only, literally the only strategy uh, or strategic game that the Biden regime has has stated is you know to fight Russia continuously, uh, you know, using Ukrainian troops as cannon fodder, and to to do so in order to, in attempt a uh, failed attempt to uh, to weaken Russia both economically and militarily. And as you pointed out, and as I point out in this article, uh, you know, Russia has been strengthened militarily by uh, by this NATO war. Against Russia, you know, economically, it's uh, you know, it's it's uh, GDP is is uh, growth is uh, greater than any NATO country right. uh, over the past year, um, despite uh, the most severe uh, you know NATO economic sanctions imaginable. Its military has been tripled in size uh, in terms of active duty military from about two hundred fifty thousand to seven hundred fifty thousand troops, and it's uh, you know its spending has gone up to Cold War levels as well. Uh, you know, so between uh, the one point five million uh, you know member uh, Russian armed forces and uh, six percent uh, GDP spending. 
which is double what it was pre-war, uh, you know, we've, we're essentially creating a new, a new Soviet threat that, that didn't exist before uh, this uh, NATO war on Russia. And that's, that's a, a huge loss for both U.S. and NATO, NATO uh, national security. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a tragedy. And I think what's so frustrating at this point is that there's really no end in sight. And I want to kind of shift to the end of your article that you wrote here. And again, for everybody watching this, we're going to put a link down here so that you can read this full article. It's really a fantastically written piece from David. But, you know, the, you kind of conclude this article with, you know, there's no chance for a Ukrainian victory. And I think that's what many people are starting to realize in the West. I think, um, and, and this has been an interesting thing, David, obviously in our own country, in the United States, you know, we have seen, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of fatigue, I think, amongst the, uh, you know, common civilian, you know, here in America, where we're starting to really get frustrated when we see, yes, we're going to send another $100 million to Ukraine. Oh, let's send another $80 million to Ukraine. Hey, another $100 million here to Ukraine. And meanwhile, there's a plethora of issues affecting this country right now. Obviously, one of the biggest ones is being the border, southern border, which many Americans feel this is a, you know, probably one of the biggest issues leading up to this 2024 election. Hey, who's going to secure the border? You know, we're having, you know, crime is increasing, you know, more and more illegals are coming into the country, yet we don't seem to be addressing the problems that affect real Americans on the ground here in the United States. But yet we are sending these, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars overseas, you know, what's with almost zero chance of a victory here. So tell us a little bit about this conclusion here, you know, no chance for Ukraine victory. You know, why is it no chance? And, you know, and what, what do you see happening for the rest of this year and into the future with this conflict? Well, yeah, I mean, as I, I stated before the war, that there was no chance for Ukraine to win. I mean, uh, Russia is a country that's 35 times larger than Ukraine is today. It's it's uh, got a population of about 5.3 times more people, uh, about five times as many troops in terms of reserves included. Uh, it's got, uh, you know, several times to, you know, as many as 12 times more tanks, combat aircraft, uh, artillery. I um, mean, just right, you know, in terms of ammunition, it's it's got a uh, at least uh, 10 times as, as much, uh, you know, for example, uh, 152 millimeter artillery, uh, you know, rounds uh, than, than Ukraine does. Uh, and it's just, you know, in addition to that, it has uh, super EMP weapons. It has the greatest uh, cyber offensive capabilities in the world. It's got, you know, I, I would estimate uh, uh, four and a half times more operational nuclear weapons than the, the U.S. itself, uh, 35 times more non-strategic nuclear weapons. So it's a, it's a massive threat. And of course, threat is, is, uh, is a mix of intention and capability. And before Russia had no intention to, uh, you know, to fight the U.S. or NATO uh, directly, but that might be changing. It's always had the capability to destroy the U.S. Uh, you know, obviously Russia's nuclear arsenal that was double the size of America's at the end of the Cold War, you know, didn't magically go away with the end of the Cold War, but the, right. the aggressive uh, communist uh, Soviet leadership did. And as you pointed out, uh, you know, Putin's not, not another Hitler or Stalin. He's not even a, another Brezhnev. Russia's responses, including the, the war in Ukraine, have been primarily defensive from a Russian perspective. It's uh, been a preventive and a preemptive war right. because the U.S. did succeed in transforming Ukraine by 2021 into a, a de facto uh, NATO member and had plans to uh, you know, further expand its, uh, the U.S. military footprint and, and base basing uh, within Ukraine. And that was a, a threat that uh, you know, Russia couldn't tolerate and the U.S. wouldn't, wouldn't have either. I mean, just imagine, you know, I wrote an article in, in the National Interest in June or July of 2022, in which I argued for more, uh, you know, strategic empathy for Russia, because if the U.S. were to, you know, have a situation where either uh, Mexico or a breakaway Texas was uh, actively allying with Russia and China, had, you know, a thousand Russian and Chinese troops in its territory that were based there, uh, you know, uh, multiple, uh, you know, joint military exercises every year, and then, you know, increasingly advanced weapons shipments, uh, to uh, you know, to Texas or Mexico, we you know we would you know bomb, invade, and, and annex all of Texas uh, in all defensive war, and that's essentially what what Putin's done with uh, regards to Ukraine. Except he's only taken eighteen percent, and he only wanted I think eleven or twelve percent initially. Uh, maybe it was much less than that, including Crimea uh, that was offered back in back in uh, in March of uh, two thousand twenty-two, and Biden stupidly torpedoed that that agreement, which would have been uh, on par. Uh, you know, a substantial victory for Ukraine. Yeah, I think, I mean, it would have been the best case scenario, you know, for Ukraine. And, and but again, I, I, I like your opening statement here that the fact that this is not an unprovoked war. I mean, there's certainly the United States is certainly involved and that that is to, tends to be our history. I mean, we get involved in conflicts and wars all over the planet. I mean, that is our MO. I mean, that's what we do better than any nation in the world. But and that certainly, you know, led to this. That's an interesting point that you made, though, that it is more of a defensive effort. And, and I think one of the other things when we're looking at geopolitics and certainly from the American side, 
one thing that we, we never do in the inside of this country is we never look at it from the opposite perspective, right? If the United States was in those shoes, how would our country react? And you really nailed it with this analogy of if Texas was a breakaway state, you know, partnering with Mexico, Russia and Chinese troops on the ground doing military exercises. I mean, all of us know how that would go. I mean, the United States would immediately invade and bomb them and, you know, and immediately take care of that situation. You know, that wouldn't that wouldn't go on for very long. It's it's really a tragedy. I, again, I think we're on the same page as well. It's a tragedy for the Ukrainian people, you know, that that we didn't get to that agreement. And now I think we're at a situation where what does the future look like, David? What is your prediction for, you know, how this officially ends? Are we going to see Ukraine eventually come to the bargaining table and say, okay, well, we could have, you know, lost 10% of the territory back then. That window's closed. So maybe it's going to be 20% today. Or, you, you know, or do we just continue seeing Zelensky fight this fight just because? And, you know, I'd like to get your thoughts on, on kind of what's the next step? How does this end? I think that's the magic question. So uh, I'd love to hear your insights on that. Yeah, you bet. So, uh, I mean, this, this war is, again, it's going to end with the Russian victory. It's only a matter of time. And, and uh, you know, back in November November 2022, a uh, former uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, uh, Mark Milley, uh, you know, stated that this is, you know, following the, the successful uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kharkiv uh, counteroffensive, uh, this was Ukraine's high watermark that we're never going to gain. You know, he didn't say it out outright, but uh, essentially stated that, uh, you know, the chances of Ukraine retaking additional territory were very minimal. And so, uh, you know, I think he overrated uh, how defeated he thought Russia was. Russia wasn't defeated, but, you know, that that would have uh, certainly been a good time to uh, to make peace. And, and Putin even offered, uh, you know, an armistice and a permanent ceasefire in September of 2022. And that's that's an offer that he never took off the table, as, as he, uh, you know, noted uh, during the Tucker Carlson interview. Uh, but, but the problem is Ukraine is running out of troops, you know, so it doesn't matter how many weapons. We never should have sent any weapons to, to Ukraine because that's what uh, caused the war to continue past March 2022. Right. We could have avoided the war, but once it began, Began, uh, it was should have been our, the responsibility of U.S. leaders to end the war as quickly as possible with the the best deal uh, we could we could mediate uh, on behalf of Ukraine. But uh, you know, with them running out of troops, uh, you know, uh, I think later this year we'll we'll likely see a major Russian offensive, particularly with. Uh, given the fact that the Russian foreign ministry has now described this no longer as a uh, you know as a special military operation, but rather as a as a war with uh, with NATO, right. uh, so uh, we're likely to see, especially with the, the terror attack in Moscow, that uh, that Putin is uh, is claiming is is a was a Ukrainian. A proxy attack, and he's likely ac accurate about that. We're going to see a major escalation, I expect, uh, no later than perhaps uh, uh, June of this year, uh, in which uh, you know Russia is going to use the 300,000 or so troops, uh, perhaps reinforced by 200, 200 or 300,000 more troops, uh, to break through the Kirkov. Kharkiv region, uh, drive, uh, you know, southwest uh, to the Dnipro River and then roll up, uh, you know, the, all of the Ukrainian troops that remain uh, uh, southeast of the Dnipro River line, uh, which will essentially cause the, the uh, Ukrainian military to collapse. And at that point, the question becomes, do, does, uh, you know, France, Britain and, and Poland send in a, a NATO expeditionary force to defend the Dnipro River line and the Bel Belarusian border? Uh, west of the Dnipro, as uh, as Macron has threatened to do, perhaps accompanied with a, a U.S. no-fly zone that right. would um, threaten a direct war with Russia in World War III, or would uh, you know would wiser and saner heads prevail, and uh, would the, you know would Biden finally uh, see the merits of an immediate armistice agreement, which could uh, preserve uh, you know prevent all of Eastern Ukraine from being effectively annexed by by the Russian Federation. Yeah, that's a that's a good insight, David. And I think um, you know the loss of Ukrainian soldiers and and their dwindling force is certainly going to be a factor. And I think this uh, terrorist attack in in uh, Moscow on the outskirts of Moscow is going to be another factor that that um, pells this even further. And I'm sure once the weather clears, you know, April May, once we get into the better weather, I think there's an issue right now with the ground actually being too soft right now for a lot of these military tanks to go, do the full invasion. But um, it's going to be interesting to see. You know, it's going to be very interesting to see. And I, I guess I mean it, it kind of seems like every one of us that are, you know, anti-war and trying to speak more rational, it's it, our, our plea is always, we hope that cooler heads can prevail and that, you know, wise decision makers can come to the front. Of course, you know, we're facing an election 
election year as well. It's a very interesting time to be in the United States with, um, you know, obviously a rematch of the 2020 election. We've got Trump and Biden, you know, uh, running again, and we're going to see, you know, how that changes for the future. But uh, David, I want to thank you so much for these insights. I think you've provided a wonderful opportunity here. I'm going to give you one um, final closing statement for everybody and, you know, final thoughts. And uh, of course, we're going to drop your information down in the description for everybody to follow along. Well, thanks again for, uh, for the opportunity uh, to be on your show. Um, we had a great discussion. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd like to invite all your viewers to, to please uh, go to my Substack at deep. Uh, pyne.substack.com. Once again, dpyne.substack.com, where, where I post uh, a lot of these cutting edge uh, articles uh, reporting on uh, various national security events, uh, which I believe are important. And, uh, you know, become a subscriber. Most of my articles are free. There, there are some that are, are a premium that, you know, in terms of if you want uh, to look at the archive, then uh, I think you may have to become a premium subscriber. Uh, and then, of course, also the uh, EMP Task Force site, uh, which I, for which I serve as executive vice president. Uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, kind of inform uh, U.S. leaders and, and the public against uh, these types of threats, uh, super EMP, nuclear and, and cyber attacks, uh, which we can most easily avoid by pursuing a policy of, uh, you know, a peaceful uh, negotiation diplomacy. But um, right. our, our website is, is at emptaskforce.us. Uh, we are a congressionally authorized board, but also a nonprofit. So we welcome uh all of your uh, uh, donations, and uh, you can even volunteer to, to serve as a state leader in, in your state for our organization. Nice. Fantastic. Well, David, again, thank you so much for your hard work on Substack and really, again, being one of the, um, you know, true American patriot who was able to, you know, decipher, you know, the, the the facts and what's what's what is false and propaganda, what are the true facts and really get to the main issue here. I think the big takeaway here and something I something agree with, something that I certainly agree with is, you know, our biggest goal right now is we need to avoid these potential nuclear threats. I mean, I, you know, a nuclear war with Russia or China um, over Ukraine and Taiwan. I mean, these would be absolute disasters for the United States, but also for the future of our planet. And it should be the primary objective right now is not to provoke, you know, these superpowers and just learn to work together and to live together and coexist. I think that's a message that the whole world needs to understand. So thank you for your hard work in that. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Make sure that you check out David's Substack. Again, we'll put that information down below and make sure you drop us a comment and look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon. Everyone, as always, I want to thank you for your incredible support. It's because of your support that our channel continues to grow every month, expanding our reach and allowing us to bring in world-class guests like David Pine into the channel for these exclusive interviews. Join us on our next chat as we discuss Israel's war in Gaza and what the United States government is doing and what needs to change before this war erupts into a regional and potentially global conflict. Click here to watch our next interview, and I look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon.